Anaxagoras was a philosopher who lived about 500 years before Christ, born in Persia, moved his way over to Greece. He's called by some the founder of monotheism in Europe, at least philosophically speaking. Uh, academics, both ancient and modern, who ignore the Bible call him that. He's also credited with coining the phrase, if you cheat me once, it's your fault, but if you fool me twice, it's mine. I like the more modern way because it sounds nice and makes sense. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. After 20 years in the land of Haran, Jacob is done being cheated by his father-in-law. But packing up and going home wouldn't be all that simple. He and Laban were kind of like a couple of career crooks whose partnership was based on what they could each get from the other one, not based on honor or loyalty or fraternity or, or anything like that. And so it was only a matter of time before these two schemers' conspiracies would boil over, and in Genesis 31, it finally happens. In the end, Jacob and his large family finally break free from Laban's cruel tyranny, uh, but it's a pretty close call. So let's take a look. Verse 1, now Jacob heard what Laban's sons were saying. Jacob has taken all that was our father's and has built this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob saw from Laban's face that his attitude toward him was not the same as before. Uh, so just to catch us up, Laban uh, had stolen all the speckled and spotted animals in violation of the deal that he and his son-in-law had made. He said, hey, what do you want as your wages? Jacob said, I'll take all the speckled and spotted animals that are in the flock right now and in perpetuity, uh, which was still a really good deal for Laban and a bad deal for Jacob had the Lord not intervened. But they agree to it, and then Laban says, great. Then he sends his sons to go take all of the speckled and spotted out of the flock and take them three days away. Uh, Jacob, for his part, was breeding the strong animals for himself and the weak ones for Laban's flocks. And so between the two of them, there's only so long everyone could keep all this undermining a secret, right? This is all being done in the open. Uh, you know, the, the, the people of the community would have said, oh, Laban's sons over there with their brand new all speckled and spotted flock that they're keeping far away from you. And people would have said, hey, what's going on here? And they would have come by. And remember, all of the flocks and shepherds would come to the watering hole together, right? That's how Jacob met Rachel. And so they'd be coming together and talking shop and seeing, hey, uh, all the Laban sheep kind of limping along, all gangly and looking sad. And, oh, yeah, and my, meanwhile, my sheep are all the strongest and best. So there's only so long they could have kept this a secret. So now six years after they made the deal, things had become obvious and blatant. Laban's sons weren't happy. Uh, it's their inheritance that it looks like Jacob is tampering with. And Laban's not happy either. He's not the kind of guy that wants to get cheated. He likes to cheat other people. I can't imagine that he and Jacob were ever on very friendly terms as father-in-law and son-in-law uh, based off of how their relationship started and how Laban continually treated Jacob. It's not like they were buddies. Maybe some of you have really good relationships with your in-laws, and maybe some of you have really bad relationships with your in-laws. It probably wasn't as strained as the relationship between uh, Laban and Jacob was, or maybe it, it is. But they didn't have a real friendly relationship, but their fragile piece was falling apart and crumbling, and you could see it on Laban's face at this point. Now, Jacob became a wealthy man, but because he had spent this long detour outside of the place where God really wanted him, he could not say, like his grandfather Abraham once said, I have raised my hand in an oath to the Lord God Most High that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, the king of Sodom, so that you can never say, I made Abram rich. And so Jacob is uh, wealthy here, and the Lord has been blessing him, but it is just kind of interesting. There, there's sort of a challenge. Laban's sons are saying, hey, 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 you got this because you took it from our father. Uh, and it's as if he had an asterisk on all of this stuff. And, and you just see the, 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 the bumpy road of faith that Jacob has walked up to this point. 
especially in comparison to the road of faith that Abraham had walked before him. Verse 3, the Lord said to him, go back to the land of your ancestors and to your family, and I will be with you. Now, scholars tell us that where it says up in verses 1 and 2 that Laban's face was not the same, the Hebrew literally reads, Laban's face was not with Jacob. Uh, And now in that moment of rejection and isolation and frustration, as always, here comes the Lord making himself known. And he says, hey, Laban is not with you, but I am with you. I am present with you. I will always be present with you no matter where you go. And there's sort of a strange opposite thing happening here in this call that, that God is giving to Jacob. It's sort of like when they do a lame reboot of a classic movie. Not that God is doing something lame, but the, the circumstances are kind of interesting. Because in Genesis 12, God had spoke to Abram, right? And he spoke to him in this very same land, the land of Haran. And he said, leave the land of your ancestors, leave your family, and go where I'm going to show you. And so now we fast forward all of these decades, and here's Jacob, and Jacob's being told, hey, go back to your ancestral land, go back to your family. You're still not in the place where I've shown your father and your grandfather. You're not in the place where I want you to be. And so he's saying, get back to that spot. Uh, Instead of abandoning your family, get back to your family. Instead of abandoning your ancestral land, get back to your ancestral land. Get back to the place that I want you to be. You see, God had a well-established place and plan for Jacob's life, and he has a well-established place and plan for your life as well. And even though we can't always perfectly understand the will of God in every situation, and certainly we don't know what's coming tomorrow, or, you know, we can't foresee the future in all, in all regards, with all that said, that's all obvious, but with that said, God has provided a great amount of information and revelation and the presence of His indwelling Holy Spirit for our daily living and for the course of our lives, right? We have been shown the way to go. We know in a sort of worldview sense, in a spiritual sense, in a philosophical sense, and in many cases, a practical sense, the way to go in life, because we've been told in God's living word, the way to go. The question is not what is the way to go in life. The question is whether we will trust the Lord and obey and follow him in that way. Verse 4 says, Jacob had Rachel and Leah called to the field where his flocks were. He said to them, I can see from your father's face that his attitude toward me is not the same as before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that with all my strength I have served your father and that he's cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God has not let him harm me. If he said the spotted sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born spotted. If he said the streaked sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born streaked. God has taken away your father's herds and given them to me. Here we see that loveliest of all Bible phrases a couple of times, but God. It's the best phrase in all the Bible, but God, right? Because if not for that phrase, um, all of us are dead in trespasses and sins. All of us have no hope for this life or the next, but God. And so it's always good to see that in the word. So Laban is combative. Laban is a cheat. Laban is a tyrant. Laban stands in the way, but God. None of that matters because but God. All these years, all these difficulties, all of these trials and frustrations, but God was present with Jacob, and God provided for Jacob, and God protected Jacob, and he sees that now. He finally looks back uh, over these last 20 years of life, and he realizes what the Lord has done, even though He was not actively worshiping the Lord, seeking the Lord, honoring the Lord with his heart or his life. It all comes into focus, and he sees that God's presence is and has been a constant reality for him. One of Jacob's sadder phrases in this passage is, you know that with all my strength I have served your father. What a waste uh, to spend 20 years of all your strength Uh, 20 years of of significant family years, life years, all of this, spending it on a a, a master like Laban. Uh, He didn't say, with all my strength, I've served the Lord, or with all my strength, I've served my own father, Isaac. No, but this spiteful, loveless pagan who doesn't care about him at all. Uh, Our masters matter, right? Your masters in life matter. 
Who are we spending our strength on? What masters? What pursuits? What desires? What plans? Uh, because the Lord comes and He says, hey, yeah, I mean, and I'm not talking about what job do you have. I'm saying, who's your master? Uh, because you can be a Philippian jailer, who I'm going to talk about in a moment, but, and, and be doing it as unto the Lord, or you can be the Apostle Paul and be doing it as unto the Lord, right? Or you can, you know, work in, for the state of California, believe it or not, and do it as unto the Lord. Daniel worked for Nebuchadnezzar. It's about the same, right? I um, mean, you can do all these different things as unto your Lord. The question is, who's your master? Because the Lord says, when I'm your master, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, and so who's your master in your life? What masters, what pursuits, what desires are you spending your strength on? Verse 10, when the flocks were breeding, I saw in a dream that the streaked, spotted, and speckled males were mating with the females. In that dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, look up and see all the males that are mating with the flocks are streaked and spotted and speckled. For I have seen that, uh, I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I'm the God of Bethel, where you poured oil on the stone marker and made a solemn vow to me, get up and leave this land and return to your native land. So like Abraham, Jacob heard God's call but hesitated in Haran. So Abraham, went back when he was Abram, was called by God. He said, leave Ur of the Chaldees, leave your family, get to the land I'm going to show you. And Abraham sort of started to obey. He brought his whole family, and then they stop in Haran. They stop in this very place, and then they're there for an extended period of time. And finally, the Lord comes back to Abram. He says, hey, it's time to go. And Abram uh, obeys all the way. And so a similar thing is happening here. God's calling back to Jacob. He says, hey, get back to this land I want you in. And the Lord was faithful to call again, even though Jacob had been hesitating in Haran. But on a relational level, I think it's a little bit sad. It's almost as if the Lord had to reintroduce himself here, isn't it? Hey, remember me? I'm the God who appeared to you at Bethel, if you remember that. That was fun, right, 20 years ago? You know, uh, also, I'm that one you made that big vow to, uh, that you are doing absolutely nothing to, to, care, to you know, make good on. That's me. Uh, you, you remember that? And so I think it's kind of sad the way that the Lord has to speak to Jacob. God spoke to Abraham um, seven times in the book of Genesis. And when he did, you can see there that the Lord would talk to Abraham like you would talk to a friend. You know why? Because they were friends. He was the friend of God. And they spoke, in some cases, almost casually together and, and the way that you would speak to a dear friend. But Jacob, he's not really a friend yet. In fact, he's going to have a fist fight with God before they really become friends, uh, which is a crazy thing to think. But not only that, he also hasn't kept his vow. He's not even thinking about his vow. And, you know, the Lord reminds him, hey, it's time, it's time for you to keep your vow to me. After all, when was Jacob going to get around to keeping that vow? He's over 100 years old already. He doesn't have that many vow years left in the tank. And it seems like he's sort of forgotten this promise he's made. Uh, and it's a good reminder, God cares about us making good on our promises to Him. You know, here at Calvary, we're all about God's grace. Grace changes everything. We want to be people defined by grace. We just love talking about the grace of God and how definitive it is and how descriptive it is and, you know, how active it is, not taking anything away from that. But God does care about when we make a promise to Him, whether we follow through on it or not. Uh, Ecclesiastes is not a book that gets quoted a whole lot, um, you know, but here's an important life lesson from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. When you make a vow to God, don't delay fulfilling it because he does not delight in fools. Fulfill what you vow. Better that you do not vow than you vow and not fulfill it. Uh, so God cares about these things. In his grace, in his love, in his compassion, in his tenderness, in his long suffering, he still cares that we do the things that we say we're going to do for him. Verse 30, uh, chapter 31, verse 14, and Rachel and Leah answered Jacob and said, do we have any portion or inheritance in our father's family? Are we not regarded by him as outsiders? For he has sold us and has certainly spent our purchase price. In fact, all the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. So do whatever God has said to you. A theme of this passage is how God's uh, family, Jacob's family, but by extension, God's family, God's people are distinct 
from the rest of the world. There is a division. There is a difference between the people of God and the people of the world. And it begins here. Rachel and Leah say, by the way, uh, based off of what we know about Rachel and Leah and how much they hate each other, how, how offended must they feel at their dad to be united and speaking as one here, right? And so we get a sense of just how bad things are in this extended family. Uh, but they say together here, listen, we are outsiders. Now that we belong with you, Jacob, we are outsiders to our family. Your version may say strangers. They felt it emotionally, but it's a reminder to us of something that is true of us as born-again Christians spiritually. If you're born again, you are no longer a citizen of this earth, at least not in the eternal sense, not in the most important sense. There's nothing wrong with uh, being proud of your heritage, being proud of your citizenship, you know, uh, on earth. It's America, the United States of America is the greatest country the, in the world, right? But, but in the truest sense, in the most important sense, you and I are not citizens of this world. We are outsiders. We are strangers. We are aliens. And so... Uh, this is told to us not in just one place or another. It's told in multiple places. For example, 1 Peter and Hebrews were identified. It says, hey, you, Christian, are a stranger, a sojourner, an alien to this world because you are now a citizen of heaven. And so that's why we don't have to be sad about being aliens to this world. Uh, if that sounds like a lonely life, being a stranger to this world, like the David Banner thumbing it down the highway, anybody... A lot of you are too young for it, but did, who watched the TV series The Incredible Hulk growing up? Oh, man, it was so great. And then it would end all the time with that sad... He's thumbing it. Bill Bixby, everybody's crying. The Incredible Hulk just wants to have friends, right? So if it sounds like a lonely life being a stranger and sojourner, that's be encouraged because Christianity does not end with us in exile. The Apostle Paul explains the other side of this stranger life in Ephesians 2.19. He says, so then you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. And so God has done this incredible thing where he says, hey, you are now distinct the world, the unbelieving world is going to look at you and consider you a stranger, consider you an outsider, consider you an exile. And even if you're not being actively persecuted, you're still going to be considered that by the unbelieving world because there is a cosmic war between the forces of evil and the Lord going on, right? And so, the, and so Paul says, but the good news is all of us are not isolated individual strangers and exiles. The Lord says, I bring you to be together, fellow citizens with other Christians who are knit together, particularly in local churches where we are fastened and joined together like living stones. But then on top of that, he says, and the Lord has brought you into his household. You're a citizen of heaven. You are a member of God's household. And so good reminder for us. Now, in the custom of the times here in Genesis, Laban should have provided his daughters with money when they were given as wives. The bride, he should have given them money that was due to them. And they're saying, yeah, he spent all of our money. He, he didn't give it to us, and now what should have been given to us is gone. And so what a sad thing. He was not only cheating Jacob. Okay, that's still wrong, but Jacob's this strange foreigner. Yeah, let's take advantage of this guy. He's not even stopping there. He's cheating his own flesh and blood, his own precious daughters. Verse 17, so Jacob got up and put his children and wives on the camels. He took all the livestock and possessions he had acquired in Paddan Aram, and he drove his herds to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household idols, and Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean, not telling him that he was fleeing. He fled with all his possessions, crossed the Euphrates, and headed for the hill country of Gilead. We're not given Rachel's motivation. Why did she do this? Uh, we'd, we're not told. These little idols, they're also called teraphim, they were probably what Laban used for divination. We saw in the last passage that he said, hey, I, I have learned through divination that I'm blessed because you're here with me, right? And Laban's a weirdo pagan, so he probably used these little carved idols for his divination rituals. 
So maybe she was thinking, I don't want my dad to be able to do his divination and figure out where we're going. And so maybe she took them for that reason to sort of handicap Laban. Maybe she was clinging to some idolatry of her own. They were, it was thought in the, this religion that, well, these teraphim would bring you blessing and bring you prosperity. And so maybe she's not quite a full-blown monotheist at this point. She's kind of bringing them along uh, for good luck. Or maybe she's just acting spitefully, having never forgiven her dad for what he did to her on her wedding night 20 years ago. Remember, she was cheated too. It wasn't just Jacob that was deceived. Rachel was probably tied up and gagged somewhere. She wanted to marry Jacob, and instead the dad was like, nah, we're sending your sister. She wasn't into that. So we don't know exactly why. No matter why she did it, it's going to cause some big trouble. In fact, her stealing the idols may have been the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back that sent Laban into a murderous frenzy and chasing after them here in a minute. It was a big risk for her to do this, by the way. According, according to the Code of Hammurabi, which would arise shortly after in that region, such an act would have been a capital crime. You would have died for stealing these idols. Verse 22, on the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his relatives with him, pursued Jacob for seven days, and overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban, another but God there is great. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night. Watch yourself, God warned him. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. So Laban gets his sons, his brothers, maybe the whole clan of people. They arm themselves and they ride hard for 300 miles to catch Jacob. Whether they're riding camels or horses, you know, we're not told. But the, to cover that amount of terrain in seven days, you're riding those animals to the breaking point. Now, based on what God says to Laban and what Laban himself will say in a minute, his intent was clearly to do Jacob and the family harm. They were clearly going to hurt them or kill them. But the night before the fight, God appears to Laban. I just love what he says, watch yourself. Ooh. <laughs> you know, the Lord, the Lord has, enough, uh, has enough power and gravitas that he doesn't have to have some elaborate, I'll do this and I'll do that, and you'll wish you've never been born. He says, hey, man, just watch yourself. And Laban's like, okay, okay, I got gotcha. you. It was enough to scare Laban into obedience, just as it had been for Pharaoh with uh, Abraham and Abimelech with Isaac. Derek Kidner, Bible commentator, points out that all three of the patriarchs had to be ingloriously extricated from a mess they got themselves in. Abraham uh, with Pharaoh in Egypt, Isaac with Abimelech in Philistine country, and then here, uh, Jacob from Laban. In the Old Testament, we see a lot of these kind of divine dreams where God was speaking to people. Why doesn't that happen more today? Well, God still can speak in a dream, and even Peter in his uh, sermon on the day of Pentecost talks about how the prophet Joel talks about your, you know, people will dream dreams and have visions and those sorts of things. And so God still can speak in a dream, but we just have something so much better than a dream. We have 66 books of reliable, infallible, inerrant inspiration that we can go to uh, in our own language and look at and relook at and read and study and see what other people have said about it. And so, uh, man, compared to the clarity and power of the Scripture, do you really want to rely on a dream? Uh, I don't know about you, and, you know, if you're the kind of person that never remembers dreams or does remember dreams, those sorts of things, all I know, it's just a funny thing. Since I've had my stroke, my dreams have been absolutely bananas, like <laughs> just crazy. They're just like stress dreams combined with movies, combined with things that have been happening, and like they're just all oh, one right after another, and like it, it's just the craziest thing. And so I'll, I'll say that I'm glad that I can just go to the living word rather than have to wade through some hate easy dream that I had, right? Verse 25 says, when Laban overtook Jacob, Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban and his relatives also pitched their tents in the hill country of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You have deceived me and taken my daughters away like prisoners of war. Why did you secretly flee from me, deceive me, and not tell me? I would have sent you away with joy and singing, with tambourines and lyres, but you didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters. You have acted foolishly. I could do you great harm 
But last night, the God of your father said to me, watch yourself, don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you've gone off because you long for your father's family, but why have you stolen my gods? Laban talks a big game. He's a windbag. Don't think for a minute that he loved his daughters and grandchildren. In the same breath where he talks about, oh, I would have kissed them goodbye, he says, I could do you great harm, and he uses the plural word for you, we're told. His intention was to hurt all of them. He asked, why have you stolen my Elohim? Remember, that's not a proper name for our God. Uh, it is a generic term for divine beings. And so he says, why have you stolen my Elohim? What a wonderful, exciting, important reminder that our God cannot be packed up. He is not carved from wood or stone. He is not made in our image. He can't be stolen away. No, he is all powerful. He is immutable. He is unique. He is matchless in every regard. Verse 31, Jacob answered, I was afraid, for I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. If you find your gods with anyone here, he will not live. Before our relatives point out anything that is yours and take it. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the idols. So Laban went into Jacob's tent, Leah's tent, the tents of the two concubines, and he found nothing. When he left Leah's tent, he went into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken Laban's household idols and put them in the saddlebag of the camel and sat on them. Laban searched the whole tent but found nothing. She said to her father, Don't be angry, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence. I'm having my period. So Laban searched but could not find the household idols. So in one moment, Laban is declaring his loving affection for his daughters and grandkids, and then you smash cut to him ransacking all of their stuff and just throwing it around because what matters most is his dumb little carved idols. Now, Jacob had no idea that Rachel had stolen the little teraphim, and in his anger, he makes a rash vow. Had they been found, Rachel may have been executed, and Jacob could have been brought back as a slave to work in Laban's house forever, shamed by the entire clan. Don't make rash vows. It doesn't work out. We have lots of examples in the Bible of rash vows and their very bad consequences. Verse 36, then Jacob became incensed and brought charges against Laban. What is my crime? He said to Laban, what is my sin that you've pursued me? You've searched all my possessions. Have you found anything of yours? Put it here before my relatives and yours and let them decide between the two of us. You notice that Laban hasn't said anything about the flocks. This all started because, hey, you stole my flocks. But even Laban knows that isn't true and that that won't hold up in their court here. Despite all of Laban's best efforts, all of Jacob's wealth was rightfully earned according to the agreement that they had made together. You could look right over at their flocks and herds and see proof. Speckled, spotted, speckled, spotted, speckled, spotted. Not a solid colored one in the bunch. Now, no doubt six years ago, Laban had laughed it up with his buddies about how he was cheating his son-in-law, how he had removed all the animals and promised to give, uh, that he had promised to give, and how there was no hope that Jacob could build a flock of his own, but he was going to work for him anyway for free. But the Lord was on Jacob's side, and now Jacob turns the tables and brings charges against Laban before the clan. Verse 38, I've been with you these 20 years. Your ewes and female goats have not miscarried. I have not eaten the rams of your flock. I did not bring you any of the flock torn by wild beasts. I myself bore the loss. You demanded payment from me for what was stolen by day or by night. There I was, the heat consumed me by day, the frost by night, and sleep fled from my eyes. For 20 years in your household, I served you. 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks. And you have changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac had not been with me, certainly now you would have sent me off empty-handed. But God has seen my affliction and my hard work, and he issued his verdict last night. Jacob did go above and beyond what the hired shepherds normally did partly because Laban demanded it, according to his speech here, but also he, he wanted to be blameless when it came to his work. When it came to his job performance, he wanted to be seen as blameless. You may not like your job, that's okay, but as a Christian, do it as unto the Lord. Go above and beyond what you have to do. It will yield spiritual benefits. That way of life worked really well for Daniel and his friends, and they had really bad jobs. 
Peter said this in 1 Peter 3.16, do this with gentleness and reverence, keep a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who, who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. So we want to operate our day-to-day -day lives at a high level of integrity and diligence and going above and beyond what it says on the job description so that we are above reproach and bringing glory to our Lord. Laban had cheated Jacob. That was common knowledge. God does not like it when people short those who work for them. This isn't just between J Laban and Jacob. This is a consistent theme throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. God does not like it when workers are shorted. And so be fair, be generous, do what's right in regard to payments. Verse 43, in Laban answered Jacob, the daughters are my daughters, the children my children, the flocks my flocks. Everything you see is mine. But what can I do today for these daughters of mine or for the children they have born? Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I. Let it be a witness between the two of us. Anaxagoras, the philosopher, is also attributed with this quote that's interesting. He said, men would live incredibly calm if these two words, mine and thine, were removed. Laban throws a, a tantrum here, uh, an epic old man tantrum. He's humiliated in front of the clan as his business practices are shown to be indefensible. He can't defend what Jacob has said. His idle theft accusation appears to be completely made up. His own daughters, who he claims he's rescuing, clearly side with their husband. He's completely out of touch with the situation. He wasn't rescuing his daughters. God was saving this family from him. But looking around, he sees he's beaten, he's done. He's afraid of this God who invades dreams and overcomes schemes, and so he's trying to save a little bit of face by making some kind of agreement here. Verse 45, so Jacob picked out a stone and set it up as a marker. Then Jacob said to his relatives, gather stones. And they took stones and made a mound and then ate there by the mound. Laban named the mound Jagar Sahadutha, but Jacob named it Galid. Then Laban said, this mound is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, the place was called Galid and also Mizpah, for he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight. If you mistreat my daughters or take other wives, though no one is with us, understand that God will be a witness between you and me. Laban has the audacity to tell Jacob, I'm not allowing you to marry any other wives from here on out. That wouldn't be right after all. When he's the one that made Jacob a polygamist in the first place. Jacob wanted to marry one lady and live out his days happily ever after with her. But, but Laban made him a polygamist, and now he's like, now don't you marry more wives, that'd be wrong. The names they give this pile of rocks both mean witness heap. Laban uses the Aramaic language. Jacob uses the Canaanite language. And so again, we see that separation. Moses keeps calling Laban the Aramean in the text. And here we have two different names for the rocks, two different deities invoked, two different lands divided by this moment. And so we see this separating out from the unbelieving world, God's faithful people. Verse 51, Laban also said to Jacob, look at this mound and the marker I've set up between you and me. You got to stop. I just love this so much. You have to appreciate just how crazy this dude is and how self-involved he is. He didn't set up the marker. Jacob did. Look, it says, verse 45, Jacob picked out the stone and set it up as a marker. But the, and then it says the rest of the people did it, but Laban is just so crazy. The only person that matters to Laban is Laban. The only thing that's happening in Laban's world is what Laban is doing. He's so selfish and so self-involved and so self-unaware, and this is the kind of person that that kind of heart creates. Verse 52, this mound is a witness, and the marker is a witness that I will not pass beyond the mound to you, and you will not pass beyond the mound and this marker to do me harm. The God of Abraham and the gods of Nahor, the gods of their father, will judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and, his, and invited his relatives to eat a meal. So they ate a meal and spent the night on the mountain. Some commentators try to suggest that they all just were so excited and they all had a big, happy family meal together. Man, this is not what's happening. This is a bitter parting. Laban is saying, you're a Canaanite. I'm an Aramean. Here's the line in the sand. You don't come this way. I don't go that way. We're done. Uh, it's an ugly 
ugly, sad scene uh, on the family level. To his credit, Jacob has really become leaps and bounds in his life of faith from these past passages we've been going through. He is a believer in, in a way that we haven't seen him believe before. He would not swear by these false gods that Laban is talking about. He only swears by the fear of his father Isaac. And maybe that was a little jab at Laban, reminding his father-in-law that he's the one that needs to be afraid, lest he offend the one true God who is fighting on behalf of Jacob. Verse 55, Laban got up early in the morning, kissed his grandchildren and daughters, and blessed them, and then Laban left to return home. What sort of affection could they possibly have for him at this point? W.H. Griffith Thomas writes, Love expressed so late as this cannot be worth much. It is what we are prepared to do for our loved ones while they are with us, not the kind of things that we say of them after they are gone. That is the real test and genuine measure of our affection. But Laban is just trying to save face. He's been embarrassed. Uh, he goes his way. You know, after seeing a vision of God and hearing the voice of God speaking directly to him, you would think Laban would become a believer, right? But he does not fall down in worship like the Philippian jailer. Right, the Philippian jailer realizes that God is in that place, and he says, man, what do I got to do to be saved? What do I have to do? I'll forfeit my job. I'll forfeit everything. I, I just need to be saved, but not Laban. He has too much pride. And so he returns back, having wasted the clan's time, back to his godless little house to live out his days exposed as a liar and a cheat. What a sad commentary on how hard a human heart can become. God himself took the time to speak directly to this man, and he immediately turned his back on the Lord. And so in the end, he is judged as the enemy. He is the outsider, right? He is the alien to heaven and to the Lord, and he is sent away empty-handed into the darkness of the story. And he, he goes away empty, uh, refusing to believe in this God who has revealed himself to him. As chapter 32 opens, we're told this, in contrast, Jacob went on his way and God's angels met him. What a wonderful thing. What a great contrast showing the blessing and the provision and the grace of God. Jacob was now going the way he was commanded. But as always, with God's commands come all the promises and the benefits and the grace and the power and the blessing that he applies to those who will obey him. And so as we close, God has called out to you too, just as he did to Jacob, just as he did to Laban. He has taken the time and the effort to reach down to speak to you and to call you by name and to ask you to go his way. And the choice is whether you're going to turn toward him or turn away from him. And so go with God, obey his commands, receive his blessings and his provision, knowing that he is with you and he is for you and he will never leave you on your own. And that even when times are tough, even when you have a tyrant over you, even when you can't figure out how you're going to escape some problem, the Lord is with you and he will not abandon you. Thank you.